in nature-based solutions. And we've seen a huge rise over the last five years or so in calls for investments in nature-based solutions. And there's a couple of advantages um, that these offer that really make them rise on the agenda. One of the key advantages is the possibility that nature-based solutions can um, achieve multiple policy objectives at one time, um, particularly mitigation, adaptation, biodiversity conservation, and economic development. And of course, we can talk about where there might potentially be some trade-offs between these, but nature-based solutions certainly offer the opportunity to think about synergies between these multiple different policy objectives. Another real advantage of nature-based solutions is that there's a lot of evidence that these are potentially much more cost effective to compare, compare to alternative strategies, particularly um, things like gray infrastructure investments. And you can see in the graph here, one um, analysis of the potential costs of a classic gray infrastructure solution of building seawalls compared to um, the much lower costs of many of the ecosystem-based adaptation strategies. So be, for these reasons, we're seeing huge increase in calls for nature-based solutions in alignment with um, major international agreements, including the Paris Agreement, the Convention on Biodiversity, and also the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, as you all know, COP26 in Glasgow is currently underway, and we can expect to see nature-based solutions being high on the agenda um, there. You know, also, as covered in the introduction, there's significant calls for investments in nature-based solutions as part of green recovery post-COVID. Um, this is really a strategy that's particularly relevant for Latin, the Latin American Caribbean region um, because biodiversity in the region, there's a real opportunity for Latin America and the Caribbean region to um, be a leader on um, nature-based solutions. And we're already seeing evidence of that happening. In addition, um, the, it's a region that is highly impacted by climate change, and um, we can use nature-based solutions as a strategy to reduce the risks of disasters and adapt to climate change. Next slide. In order to make the case for these investments, it's really important to not to also be really able to articulate the economic case of nature-based solutions. And this is true all over the world, but particularly in the region because of the high dependence on natural resources in the region and also the economic recession due to COVID has really kind of placed questions of the economic feasibility of these high on the agenda. I think this will pose some challenges, but also really highlights the importance of investing in these um, strategies for the region. There's a lot of emphasis on the um, protection quality value of nature-based solutions, as well as the um, environmental benefits in terms of carbon sequestration. But in order to make the economic case, one of the other really important elements of nature-based solutions is the job and livelihood and impact, it, sort of local impacts for communities. Next slide, please. Um, we can think about a number of different pathways through which the investments in nature-based solutions can contribute to building more jobs, more live, better livelihoods, and higher incomes for communities in the places where we invest in nature-based solutions. And so here I just have a couple of illustrative pathways um, through which these investments can lead to these economic benefits for communities. Um, really recognizing that in addition to kind of the environmental benefits and the climate benefits, we can really um, find ways to design nature-based solutions to emphasize these local economic benefits. And I'll give a couple examples from projects in portfolio of projects that UNDP has been collaborating with um, governments throughout the region um, to illustrate some of these points. If you can Move forward two slides. Um, in addition to supporting direct jobs and livelihoods for uh, individual households, investing in nature-based solutions can really help to increase the resilience of entire market systems. And this um, can have profound implications for not just 
the exact locations where we're investing in nature-based solutions, but for economies and society as a whole. Um, and here, there's just a couple examples of some of the ways that investments in um, increasing the productivity and diversity of the agricultural sector through sustainable production practices um, or connecting local producers to specialty markets, um, as well as increasing the resilience of the ecosystem services that these that agriculture depends upon um, can really improve the, the functioning of market systems, which, um, as we saw with COVID, can be um, quite often disrupted during crisis. And so these nature-based solutions have the real potential to um, increase benefits economically as well. Next slide. Um, one of the projects where you can see some of these benefits showing up is a project I wanna talk about briefly in Colombia that used payment for ecosystem services in the coffee sector. Um, there were payments for carbon sequestration to producers that were um, improving the ability to sequester carbon through their land management practices. In addition to this, there was also certification schemes for sustainable coffee production that allowed producers to receive a higher price for their coffee, as well as opening up opportunities to new markets through the use of more sustainable practices. So what, what you're seeing in the project like this is the combination of a, a wide range of different strategies that together increased incomes for producers significantly, 8% on average, but in some areas up to 29% higher incomes um, for participants through the investments in these nature-based solutions. And we also could see large landscape scale impacts in terms of coverage of sustainable coffee. Next slide. Um, another project that used a different set of nature-based solutions is a project in Guatemala um, that was focusing on productive landscapes. And this project really focused on building commercial networks and certification for producers across a variety of different value chains and pairing that again with payment for ecosystem services for agroforestry and soil and water conservation. The combination of the introduction of these best practices and the agroforestry and soil and water conservation practices led to significantly increased productivity and yields for producers and also had the benefit of reducing the use of chemical inputs um, because the ecosystem services that producers were relying on was improved through these nature-based solutions. So you can see that there's economic benefits, but also there's synergies that start to develop um, across a range of these benefits. And then some of the benefits also are non-monetary. We can see significant improvements um, in food sovereignty and food security for households through the interaction of family gardens and diversified crop production. Um, and so this really illustrates that not all of the benefits are captured economically, but there's significant benefits for local resilience. Next slide. And the last project that I wanna mention is a project in Cuba um, that's perhaps the best illustration of kind of the most classic example of nature-based solutions as an alternative to gray infrastructure um, to support reduction of um, vulnerability to coastal flooding. So this included mangrove restoration efforts as well as agroforestry efforts further um, inland to reduce flooding risk. But what's really interesting about this project is that it also um, paired these ecosystem-based approaches with the promotion of sustainable tourism and incorporation of diversified livelihoods, such as beekeeping, to ensure that um, these protective measures also were addressing the economic and livelihood needs of um, communities. And an additional benefit that emerged once these practices were in place was that there was increased productivity and diversity of fisheries because of the improved water quality due to these investments, again, having additional economic benefits for fishermen in the area. Next slide. So as we're seeing these, just to wrap up, what I wanted to clarify is that there's so many different contributions as we invest in nature-based solutions by improving the productivity and diversity of the agricultural sector, connecting local producers, enhancing the resilience 
Um, and all of these work together, um, but they're not necessarily um, automatic. They have to be designed carefully to ensure that these synergies will exist. Next slide. And so when we're thinking about what this, what it takes to achieve these benefits, we really need to create the enabling conditions to really focus on these local resilience benefits. Um, there's huge potential for nature-based solutions to provide these benefits, but it's not automatic. It requires um, building many multi-component aspects together to achieve these synergies. We also see through these projects that the benefits to vulnerable households extend beyond simply creating new jobs or livelihood opportunities or increasing incomes, but that there's a whole host of other ways that these contribute to local resilience and that the geographic ben benefits of nature-based solutions extend far beyond the communities in which these strategies are implemented um, through their implications on the ecosystem services that communities are relying on, as well as through their broader market uh, implications. So I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, this was a great work that, that we did to do an initial uh, mapping of our own portfolio that we've had with the support of our great um, of access to vertical funds from the Jeff, from the Adaptation Fund. And that has allowed us to begin to innovate into what these nature-based solutions look like and how they can actually work. So in order to get that, because we know nature-based solutions has begun to be introduced within the dialogue within kind of negotiations, strategies, donor strategies as well, um, we wanted to get a quick polling on if you, the audience, um, under, well, had an idea what these nature-based solutions are, go beyond the buzzwords to what it really means, and to really get an idea if you think that they work, and what are the main challenges to kind of bridge the divide between what is the theory, what is the buzzword, and what is the practical? So I would like to introduce to introduce your quick polling. Um, we have three questions. Um, I don't know if they can be uh, shared now with with uh, with our with with the whole audience. Um, the first one being, what are nature-based solutions? I mean, what are, how are they different from what we have been doing maybe in the past? Um, the second question we would like to ask you is, do they work? Uh, I mean, I know we've shown a couple of examples, what we've seen in our projects, but do you really think they can become a policy? I mean, we will introduce now um, three examples of how they do work, but just get an idea of that. And finally, what you think are the main challenges? Why haven't they been used so, so, so much? What do you think are the biggest barriers? So we'll give you guys a couple of seconds, um, 10 seconds in the sake of time. Of course, you can still answer while the, while the panel goes on, but just to give you guys an, an idea, to give an opportunity of where we are in this and where, and, and hopefully that our speakers will be able to introduce it to, to give you greater background on this. And we will present the results after the panelists, hoping that we will be able to actually address these concerns better. So with that being said, I would like to introduce um, Mrs. Bueno, Dr. Odalis Goicochea from the government of Cuba, um, Laura introduced a little bit of our mangrove restoration project there with the help of Adaptation Fund, but this is part of a larger strategy that the government of Cuba has done to really uh, manage climate change. So please, uh, Dr. Odalis, el por su usted. Thank you so much for joining us today. Right now we know that, of course, Zoom has allowed me to stay connected. So thank you so much for just inviting me and having me in this session, just to address what are the solutions that we are trying to use to face climate change. Accordingly, I would like to show you my presentation. Can you see my presentation? 
I think it would be nice if I could see my presentation. Okay. In terms of this nature-based adaptation, just like we mentioned, this is how we call it, at least in Cuba, we call it ecosystem-based adaptation. This is not a concept that is explicitly stated in our country policies as such. Accordingly, the important part here is that for a long time now, the previous slide, please, the previous one. For a while now, we have been discussing ecosystem-based adaptation from the national social and financial development system and plan. One of our approaches or strategies related to natural resources and the environment, we have been able to establish three general objectives, very specific ones, each and every one of this. And we had addressed them individually. They would lead you to understand what kind of areas we are addressing in our country. And also we have been able to face the climate change disasters, specifically whenever we realize that our whole population is specifically threatened in our archipelago. So I can share the national strategy that was recently passed, specifically to take actions from now on to 2025. This biological diversity program recognizes the need of working with these ecosystem goods and assets and services. And based on that, to work just based on this, we also have some other programs that are also funded by the Regional Facility Fund for the Environment. This is part of the projects that we know as incubator projects, but we also have other initiatives which are finances for biodiversity and also the UN program for development or UNDP. For a long time, we have been able to just really work with ecosystem-based adaptation actions based on these principles. Like I mentioned and like my colleague Laura has already shared with you, but this plan to face climate change, which is one of the main policies that we have in Cuba that is called Tarea Vida, that is also known internationally. And if we were to just really focus on this Tarea Vida program, we would realize that many of the actions that we are including there are mainly just trying to support the restoration of our ecosystem, specifically those ecosystems that are in our country and on which the life of our people is based and where we see the hardest impact due to these disasters. Since we have a high recurrence or frequency of these hurricanes and other natural disasters, And in the past, we did not have them as frequently as we have them now. If we talk about the work that we have developed in our country, we have to continue working in those actions that are ecosystem-based adaptation actions, such as just somehow start to restoring our forests, our beaches. We used to talk about all of the natural conditions and this is the main focus that we have had in our country. What are the costs of working in restoring these ecosystems, protecting life, the life of our population overall, and also developing other types of financial activities, let's say tourism, residential housing development as well. Cuba has a group of experiences which have been widely accepted in the country and that have proven 
the feasibility of just having this type of development. In this case, we have been trying to recover our sandy beaches, specifically for tourism. And for us to be able to also restore these activities from an environmental standpoint, because our populations are being highly impacted on because of this disaster, we're talking about all types of mangroves, reef areas, in overall, there is a huge intent of actions that we're trying to develop in this country to continue working on the recovery of sandy beaches, like I said, which is about 400 or more that we have been addressing and working on, and we are prioritizing. Also, we have an experience that has helped us a lot. And this, this is related to this mangrove recovery in the southern part of Artemisa province as well. This mangrove recovery that we've seen has had other types of innovative results, not only those that we have been able to recover and also the involvement of our population. These are those elements that we have just somehow followed in terms of these policies. And we have just worked consistently in these policies in those social aspects. How are we going to get the engagement of the population that has been working on this? How can we make use of all of this with all of the traditions that we have and that could also somehow foster the different actions that are specifically intended to restore these ecosystems that could also lead us to have more recovery actions, like I said, to really be able to restore our mangroves and also to restore our reef areas. Over the past months, we have improved our sustainability as the population has also included all of these actions as part of their lives. So I think that we are in a slide that we have already completed. So if you could move forward, that would be nice. So we are in Nicosta or My Coast project. This project has been recently passed, middle, uh, let's see, mid period of this year. This is one of the periods that mainly focuses Actually, we have had the work of over 1 million persons across different provinces, municipalities in our country. Mi Costa or My Coast project is also going to address very sensitive projects in many areas of our country as well. Specifically, since we have seen a lot of coastal erosion, we have also seen some sort of salty areas that have somehow continued to have an impact on this resource, which is water, and that is so valuable for an island like ours. So this is a consistent way in which we can just start facing climate change just after recovering this, the, the main features and functions that our ecosystems have. So also to address some of the questions that Montserrat was mentioning, what are the reasons why we should start focusing on all of these actions for us to continue moving forward? Basically, we can get a challenge where lots of adverse impacts based or as a consequence of climate change, and many of them have been said and have uh, change different meteorological phenomena. So the challenge of how much can we do and the same impacts are still affecting. There is another thing that is also closely related. Everything that you can do for legal or any other infrastructure based on the adaptation of the systems are the different elements that we just need to start including in the public policies of the countries so they can be included in for the 
environment so facing the climate change and this will be passed uh, soon. In the case of Cuba, we also have the economic aspects to consider, which are quite important. We have a very complex situation, economically speaking, but they should also be along with the economic studies so we can see how we can perceive the different benefits so we can bring along with the different infrastructures that we are going to develop in the community or in this vulnerable region. Therefore, you can also confirm that all the solutions based on the ecosystem can provide a lower cost of solutions. Up to a certain way, we just need to double confirm that and that's why we are still working and this is uh, basically what I wanted to say. And then I will wait for your questions if the panel has some. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Odalis, for such an amazing presentation for that strategy. And it has a completely different perspective now to save some time and then taking into account some of the main or the key point of the strategies to integrate the communities and to start uh, including these projects in a more broadened strategy. So we can start seeing all these benefits from the economy perspective. Also, I, I will also start with uh, Mrs. Leticia Gutierrez, so she can tell us a little bit of the experience in Mexico City about the different uh, points from her, her presentation. Thank you, Monse. Good morning, everybody. It's quite an honor to participate in this event and to share the different experiences from Mexico City, something that we are implementing in, from the nature perspective in downtown. Just as a brief context of Mexico City, because you tend to associate Mexico City as a mass city, it's not only a big city now, for our new constitution that has recently approved a state city with a political power similar to the other states in the country. Within the Mexico City, we have 16 municipalities. These municipalities have their own purpose and features, sociodemographically speaking. More than half of our territory, we have wetlands and forests or rainforests. That's why we just need to focus in nature and then people. We just need to focus in people and nature so we can make a progress in these environmental policies. Mexico City has a very particular feature because Mexico City in the pre-Hispanic times used to be a lake. So we used to be a lake and now it is a huge metropolis with more than 8 million people in the more dense uh, area and more than 20 million people in the whole metropolitan area. We live in a critical situation of uh, water shortage and at the same time, floodings. This is like a paradox because we used to be a lake and we already had this high, uh, hydraulic crisis. Only 18% of the population will receive water every day. We have more than 300,000 people that are not even connected to the water network. There is a use of water where the areas could receive more than 200 up to 300 or 500 liters per day 
of water compared to other areas where they not get anything at all. So we can create some floodings and we can get some other impacts in the city. In addition, there are some areas in the municipalities, especially at the center, that they have the heat island um, phenomenon where they can get up to four degrees the center of the city or the downtown this is like a urban heat aisle where you can get and they have an important health impacts another impact that is also a risk although it is not related to the climate change but it's something that we're also considering are all the processes of that are building and they're being to feedback by all these social processes in order to address the risk and seismic impacts. Mexico City is within the volcanic area that is called the fire belt. And we have the riskiest area in eight of the municipalities. We have gotten very important seismic movements that have ad allow us to be adapted that could be transformed in, into good practices into all this adaptation process to the climate change. In Mexico City, I was also talking about this inequality that is not only social inequality, but also at the territory level. Mexico City, you can see the difference where there is an average of six square meters of green areas per person as an average. And there are others where you can have 12 or 15 square meters. And in Iztapalapa municipality, you have less than a square meter. For that, where the health organization or WHO, they suggest 10 square meters. So you can see these inequalities is not in the remote areas. You can see that there's only a wall dividing one area to the other. And of course, where there are no uh, green areas, you have more floodings, more health problems, and more impacts from the climate change. You can see also the whole area or the whole map of the area of Mexico City and more than 58% of our territory is a natural area. We have natural areas that could be protected. We have wetlands, rivers. So we have more than a half of the territory like that. So it's important to see that. And we are also promoting and boosting the agroecological production. You can imagine Mexico City as a huge city. And at the south of it is like, uh, like the lower or the bottom part of a pear. And it, this is the lung of the city. That's why we have decided to set at the center the nature. We have the well-preserved wetlands and to preserve them in an important way so we can restore them and to connect them with different drainage systems to other parts of the city. So we're also opening some spaces at the urban area so we can get more nature to those who have less or have less access to these natural uh, areas. Environmental policy here in Mexico City, we are going to have the solutions based on nature is to set the nature at the center as one of the main principles, not only to tackle back the climate change emergency, also for the biodiversity and many other things. We're trying to communicate that as simple as possible. I was uh, listening in the previous uh, panel and in the introduction, what is exactly this? What does that mean? If somebody, an ordinary people that live in, in a city that needs to commute for more than an hour and a half to go to care of his job, well, I'm going to try to give you a series of examples of, ser of several interventions that we're working around this concept that try to find an answer to that specific question. 
what does that mean to have water by maybe with these uh, rain and crops system, maybe to have a rural population to promote different activities, um, agroecological system and practices and biofertilizers rather than a uh, traditional one. So first of all, what I want to uh, express with this slide is that we want to communicate that we are going to recover from different concepts, different practices or theories to understand what is resilience and adaptation as a process, a process that is being built from the nature and from the communities. One of the examples of policies and programs that we are using based on this uh, policy is the master plan for green infrastructure for Mexico City. What we are trying to get is to get four principles to increase the amount of green areas and nature that we can have access all the people that live in Mexico City, as well as the quality of these areas. The quality, depending if it's a, a very well-preserved ecosystem, we need to keep it like that, or if it's just an urban park, when we just need to start restoring or planting some endemic or native plants. So what we just need to have in this green infrastructure plan first, it is related to connectivity. That means that all the spaces that we are selecting to improve is with the purpose of increasing this uh, connectivity among all the green areas that could be in the suburbs or in the outskirts of the city. Accessibility, that is to distribute all the benefits from the different green areas, especially for the uh, social accessibility from the different groups of the people, thinking in children, women, young people. And third, the how it could function. That means if we talk about the ecosystem restoration, for instance, the wetlands that we have at the south of the city, then they should be functional. Then, then we need to devote some of the resources so they can be restored. But if we talk about like a park, a small park, especially in an urban area, we just need to start thinking about what type of services they need that means with the environmental services in the ecosystem that we're searching. If we talk about uh, an urban park, then we just need to have more trees that they can provide some shadow. And then resilience, where we are trying to measure how to include the different areas and all the communities can adapt better and recover from the different uh, extreme climate changes. Another example of what we're doing is all these uh, natural areas that are protected, we are trying to restore them, not only by conservation or preservation actions, but also in a different scheme that we call a social environmental actions, where we are trying to get a safe access to all type of people because we had some protected areas that, that were um, restricted to the people and the people could not. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We do apologize for the interruption of this parallel session. However, we do have a press conference that will be broadcast live. Thank you so very much for understanding. in our city. We also have this friendly structure to make them accessible. And also that we have some data of the different surfaces. 